Thank you very much. <clears throat> Can you all hear me okay? Uh, first thing, let's pray and commit the time to the Lord. So Lord Jesus, thank you for being here. Thanks for the promise that if two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in their midst. And Lord, we give you the praise and thanksgiving that any victory, uh, anything that uh, has gone on good in my life and the lives of any of us here is because of you and your grace and your love for us. So Lord, we give our lives to you and our hearts to you. And we pray that you would teach us and speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, I, it's funny having to start off a talk with a disclaimer, but anytime you talk about things sexual, uh, you run on it's thin ice, and I'll just kind of give through some of the, uh, the the pitfalls. Is that there's really no good way to talk about sex in our culture. Uh, there's four different ways you can really talk about things that are sexual. You can use guttural language, which I'm sure that in our post or pre-Christian days, most of us are pretty uh, adept at saying things in unflattering ways. Uh, we can also use uh, little kid language. I got an owie on my woo-woo. Uh, and talk along those ways. You can use uh, Hebrew poetic language. Um, you know, your neck is like an alabaster beam. Your, your eyes are like a doe. Your breasts are like, and my wife yelled at me one night when I was saying those things to her. And she said, what are you doing? And I said, well, it's called foreplay. I'm just doing what Song of Solomon did with the Shulamite woman. And she says, don't ever compare me with a deer. You know, okay, okay. So that, that didn't work. So it may work for you, but it didn't work for me. Or you can use medical terminology. And if I feel the need to describe body parts, I'll say the medical terminology. Even saying that could be offensive to some people. I've been chewed out once for saying uh, things that were medically correct and accurate. But uh, for some people, that's offensive. Uh, even in talking about things sexual, it can stir up past memories. I recognize that. It's not my desire to hurt people. It's not a desire to, to stick a finger in a wound or rip off a scab. Uh, and so we'll pray again after this disclaimer because Satan will try to have a field day with this. And I know some of you, even in a group this size, at least one or two of you men have been sexually abused. And by based on the number of women here, at least two or three or maybe more women have been abused, raped, molested. And unfortunately, those numbers are just going to go up. One out of six uh, people visiting a rape crisis center in Monterey County are men. And uh, as uh, our culture continues to degrade, then you're going to see more and more of that. And so again, it's not my desire to, to bring up past wounding hurts, but again, to offer hope. Because the scripture, I believe, has hope and offers hope and a balm, regardless of what happens in your background or in your past. And uh, I may tell or feel the need to tell a joke. I think jokes are appropriate and fun. But for some people, I've been chewed out for telling jokes. And their attitude is, you can't laugh or joke about any Anything sexual because it's too painful and, uh, and my response is go get a life you know <laughs> because humor can lighten up a serious mood and this is a serious topic I don't know if I'll tell any jokes tonight but if I do just be forewarned that I, I hope it's in good taste I think it's in good taste uh, because Ephesians 429 still has to apply it says, let no unwholesome word proceed out of your mouth, but only such as is good for edifying as fits the occasion, that it may impart grace to those who hear. That is the tightrope I have to walk. We're going to talk about all things sexual, and even the question and answer period, you can ask any question on any aspect of sex, and I'll give a biblical answer as best I know how, plus a reference to back it up. And you can challenge me on that. And if you don't like it or like, like what I say, then give me your verse. And then we'll talk civilly about what the Bible teaches. I want to teach what I believe what the Bible communicates on things sexual. And the Bible is not, is not mamby-pamby about things that are sexual. Right off the get-go, you get a very, uh, you get a, 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 the rape of Diana. You know, the guy lures her in, and then the, her brothers are so mad that they, they bring all the men out of the city, and they convince them to get circumcised. And then in the height of their soreness, then they attack and kill all the men. Uh, you get uh, uh, a guy who's so, you know, desirous sexually for his half-sister that he lures her in and asks his daddy, their daddy, if she can bring him soup in bed. And she does, and his, uh, his friend was on cohorts, and once he left, he raped her. And, uh, of course, that was uh, one of David's sons. Then you get David, you know, who was called a man after God's own heart, who had multiple wives and concubines, but still took Bathsheba, another man's wife. 
Then you get a gang rape that took place in the book of Judges where the woman was raped so repeatedly that she died. And her owner cut up her body and sent the pieces around Israel and said, should this be done in Israel? The Bible has a lot to say from orgies to gang rapes to rapes to uh, uh, girls, uh, two little daughters getting, not little, but uh, getting their dad drunk so they can have sex with him, so they can have uh, babies because they thought all the guys had, uh, were gone. They couldn't have... The, uh, that's the story of Lot and his daughters. And then you get Sodom and Gomorrah where homosexual men had surrounded uh, the house of Lot and were demanding to, quote, no, have sexual intercourse with the two angels who came. Of course, they didn't know they were angels. There's a lot of pretty explicit stuff in the Bible about sex and sexuality. So in the midst of all this, Ephesians 4.29 still has to apply. Let no unwholesome word proceed out of your mouth, but only such as is good for edifying, as fits the occasion that it may impart grace to those who hear. Now, if you have a little uh, electronic phone, smartphone, take notes. I'd encourage you to write down every verse that I mention, look them up, see if these things are true, be a Berean Christian, and, uh, and, and if you miss it, just ask me, just interrupt me, say, what was that verse again, and, and uh, we'll repeat it, or write it down, uh, and all these different things. So, and then uh, I, am, I also know that this is one of Satan's strongest strongholds right now going on in, both in, in our country, but particularly in this area of our country. And many of you have been, and maybe even now, are under demonic at attack, oppression. I have been. I know others who have been. When I first took over the ministry at the Naval Air Station Alameda, uh, the previous month before I got there, there were six guys living in a bachelor pad, all believers, all trying to grow. And one night at 2 in the morning, you know, a knock came on the door, and it was a CHP asking if uh, Joe Blow lived there. And uh, the leader of the house, who was an ab rep, a friend of mine, said, yeah, he lives here. And I says, well, can you go check and see if he's here? And he goes, well, I'm sure he is. It's 2 in the morning. And he goes, well, please check. So he went. His bed was empty. And he came back and says, what's going on? He says, well, he found his car running on the Bay Bridge with a pair of shoes. We think he jumped. And sure enough, they found his body three days later. And then in trying to reconstruct what had gone on, he had a secret life. And he had been visiting uh, prostitutes. Uh, but yet he was a Bible study leader. So he had a two, two things going. He had a Christian life and he had a second life. And he was so oppressed and so guilty, so beat down, that he felt his only way out was to kill himself. And that day, that before he'd done it, he went to one of his buddies and said, I need to talk to you. I need to just come clean. And the buddy had said to him, listen, I don't have time now. Let's talk tomorrow. And uh, there wasn't a tomorrow. And because, you know, at this point, the, the, I believe it was demonic. He was being harassed, and it led to his death. And make no mistake, Satan wants to kill us. He prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. And he will use sin and guilt and shame, and particularly sexual sin, as one of his key primary targets. 1 Corinthians 6, uh, starting at verse 18 to the end of the chapter, says, Every other sin which a man commits is outside his own body, but a man who commits sexual sin sins against himself. It's distinguishing, because once you sin sexually, it just will gnaw on you the rest of your life. You know, I met with a young guy, for, part of my, my full-time job is I disciple men. And I meet with anywhere from 10 to 15 men each week individually for training, accountability, and discipleship. And that was a sh one Air Force major. And uh, he had sought me out. And he says, I heard you could help in the area of things sexual. And I said, well, I can, I can take what God has given me and try to give it to you. He goes, what's going on? And, uh, and he didn't want to tell me. He, huh, he hemmed and hawed, and finally it came out. When he was a young teenage boy, his parents had been missionaries, and he was overseas. And in overseas, pornography was much more rampant even than it is in America, believe it or not. And he was looking at pornography. And his little sister came in, started looking at pornography. They started making out. And then he committed incest with her. And now he's 35 years old, married with three kids. And every day, every day, he's hounded by the memories of that. He had gone to his dad. He had gone to his mom. He had gone to his church. And like as a 14-year-old kid, had confessed, and they had all forgiven him. And he had received forgiveness from all of them, except he couldn't forgive himself. And Satan, the accuser, was just on him all the time, reminding him. And he couldn't, he couldn't shake it. And I said, yes, I can help through God's grace and through the, the tools he's given me, which is primarily his word, is that we can fight, we can learn how to fight the demonic aspect that's on you and hindering you. So we'll pray and bind every demonic scheme uh, before we go on. And then it's a fine line. I, I want to be as clear and, as I can, but I don't want to be pornographic. And I know that even in talking these stories, it could create the little play button of the VCRs in your mind and you could relive stuff. I don't want to do that. I want to be as clear and specific as I need to be, but don't cross that line. And for some, 
I, I just pray that I don't. And so that will be part of the, the praying. And I don't want to give any new ideas to send. There's a bumper sticker that says, lead me not into temptation. I can find it myself. And, and I know one thing is that you all are expert sinners, as am I, based on 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation's overtaken you that's not common to man. So you don't need me to give you any ideas about how to sin. So I don't want to give you any ideas. I'm not going to give any websites or any of those types of things to avoid because then I know how sin nature works. Is that You'll go look it up and see if it's really as bad as I say it is. And so no new ideas to sin. And then I want to be biblically correct, but I can guarantee you what will come out of my mouth tonight will not be politically correct. And I'm not trying to, to say anything politically. I'm not endorsing anybody. And so I'll say things that probably would be censured, and I would be condemned and have hate mail. But I will give a biblical verse. And I'm not trying to do it to slam anybody or to hurt anybody or to condemn anybody. I'm going to share my, my story and what God has done and what I think the Bible teaches in these areas. So that's kind of, that's my long preamble. So let's pray again, and then we'll jump kind of into the, into the message. So Father, thanks for these folks coming out tonight. Father, again, in the name of Jesus and by the blood of Jesus, we cancel every demonic scheme that's been directed against uh, me and against the, the, each, each folks uh, person here, and against this room and against this whole uh, talk tonight. Lord, we cancel any curse that's been spoken over us, me, this group, we ask that you'd send extra warring angels, that you would gird up and guard our minds, that you would uh, let truth reign into our hearts and our souls. And Lord, that you'd speak to us. Holy Spirit, we invite you to speak to us. And Lord, I pray that if I say anything that's inaccurate or unbiblical, that you would cause each person here to quickly forget it. And Lord, I pray that the, the truth that is shared, that you would quicken it and that you would not let them forget it. And that each person here is, uh, is here for a reason. You brought them here either for themselves or to help somebody else. So I pray that they would uh, get and gain from you what you would have them to learn. So Lord, we thank you for this. We praise you that you're our God, our Savior, and that the blood of Christ can save us from all sin, regardless of what we've done or how deep we're into it. Lord, we just give our lives to you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, I went to the Naval Academy and uh, Enterprise uh, in Bainbridge, uh, two ships. I certainly work with the Navigators, and I work with the Navy Postgraduate School. There's about 1,800 officers, mid-grade officers, getting either master's or PhD. We've been there since 1989. Uh, my wife and I, we've got uh, three kids and five grandkids. So I just flew up from San Diego uh, with four of my grandkids. My daughter had twins in June. June was a big month for us. My wife got a kidney transplant, and uh, my daughter had twins, and my daughter-in-law moved in with us. So we had three major events uh, that uh, have gone on. So, uh, And I also work, this is a postgraduate school, and I also work at the uh, Navy uh, Def uh, Defense Language Institute. They teach about 45 different languages there. Uh, American military guys who are learning languages, that will help them in their, uh, in their career. How many of you guys are veterans, by the way? Any veterans in the group? Wow. Wow. Well, we're going to change that tonight, uh, <laughs> and I'll explain later. So here I am, a young kid, 10 years old. My dad walks out of my mom, leaves her with cancer and five kids. He had met a younger model, and uh, he married her. She was seven years older than my oldest sister. And it was shortly after this I started looking at pornography. And, and, and sadly, in our neighborhood, I grew up in Joplin, Missouri. Uh, in the same hospital that was blown away by a tornado about five years ago uh, that hit Joplin. And um, five other families all had boys my age, and all the dads had left their moms. It was really the first fruits of the Playboy philosophy of, of uh, Hefner. And so uh, all the guy, all the dads had pornography in the house, stashes. And so as a 10-year-old kid, uh, one of the older neighborhood boys came up to me and said, hey, you want to look at this? And I did, and I saw my first image of a naked woman. And said, you want to see more? And I go, sure. I felt like uh, I found the holy grail of life. Went to a tent in one of the backyards. All the guys had brought in their pornography. And uh, all the boys got naked pre-puberty. Got naked, touched each other uh, uh, inappropriately. Uh, teaching me how to masturbate, masturbating each other. So all my sexual experiences when I first started were with same sex. And it was all in the fantasy realm. I was constructing a, a, a world view, a life view of what it meant to be a man, what it meant to uh, have a woman, what it meant in sexuality. Uh, also, I didn't understand, but I was also learning how to take all my emotions that were negative and hurting and change them into sexual 
uh, actions and motions. So anytime I had any kind of deep emotions, it would run into sexuality. So here I've looked at pornography a lot. I was a klutz in high school. I was a, gird, a nerdy neek, a geek, and um, struck out with all the women. So now I'm in the Navy. And I'm on my first training cruise. I go down to New Zealand. My roommates had figured out that I had never been drunk and never been laid. And so they said, we're going to help you to become a man. Now notice the, the construct, what it means to be a man. And that, in mentality, it meant to get drunk and have sex. If you did that, that made you a man. <laughs> and so they said, we're going to help you. And so I had a choice. I had become a Christian when I was a senior in high school. I gave my life to Christ. And, uh, and I was growing. And I was uh, kind of in the Word. And, uh, but not much. I was a baby Christian. And so I, it came a time that I, I gotten around some guys in a Bible study. And so now we were pulled into a port in Auckland, New Zealand. And on one side, my roommates and my old roommates had said, okay, you have a choice. Tonight you can go out with us to the bars and the hookers and we, and we can help this virginity problem. And over here...